chapter 33, and we're looking at the second in our series of um, bold prayers, and it's found in verse 18 of this passage. We're going to read from verse 12 um, uh, of, of Exodus chapter 34. Just to um, give you a little bit of background, um, Moses came down from the mountain after receiving the, uh, the tablets of the law from, from, from God. He found the Israelites once more being disobedient and doing their own thing, and they had created an image of a calf that they were worshipping and celebrating, and they were getting drunk, and uh, it was a scene of, of debauchery. Uh, in his anger, he broke the tablets, um, God himself was angry, um, but Moses pleads with God, and then we get to this passage where they are speaking together. So from verse 12, Moses said to the Lord, you have been telling me, take these people up to the promised land, but you haven't told me whom you will send with me. You call me by name and tell me I have found favor with you. Please, if this is really so, show me your intention so I will understand you more fully and do exactly what you want me to do. Besides, don't forget that this nation is your very own people. And the Lord replied, I will personally go with you, Moses. I will give you rest. Everything, everything will be fine for you. Then Moses said, if you don't go with us personally, don't let us move a step from this place. If you don't go with us, how will anyone ever know that your people and I have found favour with you? How else will they know that we are special and distinct from all other people on the earth? And the Lord replied to Moses, I will indeed do what you have asked, for you have found favour with me, and you are my friend. Then Moses had one more request. Please let me see your glorious presence. He said, the Lord replied, I will make all my goodness pass before you and I will call out my name, the Lord, to you. I will show kindness to anyone I choose and I will show mercy to anyone I choose. Which you may, look, may not look directly at my face for no one may see me and live. The Lord continued, stand here on the rock beside me as my glorious presence passes by, I will put you in the cleft of the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed. Then I will, re will remove my hand and you will see me from behind, but my face will not be seen. And may God speak to us from his words. So as we come to hear what God... Father, we pray now that you will take human words and speak through them. I wonder if you've ever been starstruck, you know, seen someone famous, a sports star, pop star, uh, one you might consider to be a hero or a role model. If you've ever been in that situation, I wonder what you did. Did you say or do something out of character because uh, of the fact that you were so starstruck? Did you stand open mouth, gawping? not saying a word. Well, here's a true story of somebody who was starstruck, and it took place in America. A woman entered a Hagen dazs store on the Kansas City Plaza for an ice cream. After making her selection, she turned and found herself face to face with one of her film star idols, Paul Newman. He was in town filming the movie Mr. and Mrs. Bridge. And Newman's blue eyes caused her knees to buckle and she felt a little bit overwhelmed. So she managed to pay for her cone and left the shop, her heart pounding. When she gained her composure, she realized she didn't have the ice cream cone. So she went back into the store to get it and met Paul Newman at the door. And he spoke to her. Are you looking for your ice cream cone? He asked. She nodded unable to get a word out and he said well you put it in your uh, you put it in your bag with your purse <laughs> and that's the thing being starstruck can have a strange effect on us but i've got a more important 
question for you. When was the last time you were God struck? It's a little bit like being star struck, but it's on a completely different level. It's being so aware of God's presence, so aware of his majesty, so aware of his glory, that your knees buckle, they give way, and you fall prostrate on the floor. The weight of the experience is too much to bear. And being God struck is a life changing experience. But that's in fact what Moses was asking for when he said to God, Show me your glory. He was saying, I want to be God struck. I want to be so overwhelmed by your majesty and your presence. I want to be so overwhelmed by your beauty and perfection that I'll never forget it. He was asking to see the very essence and nature of God in order that that experience would invade his thoughts and dictate his life. And that's what makes this a really bold prayer. Of course, it had happened before to Moses. You remember when he first felt called by God to lead the uh, Israelites out of Egypt? There in that burning bush, that bush which was a bush, but all around it were flames of fire. And God spoke from within, saying, I am who I am, and I've chosen you. And Moses falls to his face in recognition that he's in the presence of somebody altogether different from him. And we've all had experiences, haven't we, where God's touched our lives in a very special way, and it's been so real and so powerful, and we've almost felt his glory. The trouble is, as life goes on, it wanes. It grows less and less. And Moses, although he had that experience his many many years ago in the desert, before he led them out of Egypt. Now, many years later, trying to lead this disparate group of people to do God's will and to lead them into the promised land, he needs again to experience that glory. Show us your glory, he says. Before we consider the prayer, let's just understand the context again. I've mentioned it before, but Moses had come down from Mount Sinai the first time. He spent time with God. God had instructed him in the law, what the law was. It was all written down on tablets of stone. And when he returned, he found that the Israelites, because they were frustrated with waiting, frustrated with waiting for God to reveal himself, thought, okay, what we'll do is we'll make our own God. And in so doing, they broke the very first of the commandments that was going to be given to them. You shall have no other gods but me. You shan't make any graven images. But that's what they did. And they danced and they celebrated and they drank and they debauched themselves in front of that golden calf. And Moses was so angry, he threw the commandments down and the stones shattered. God was also angry. He was ready to destroy the people of Israel. But Moses, with another bold prayer, actually intercedes on their behalf. Don't destroy them. These are your people. Forgive them. And God listens in his great mercy to the prayer and spares the people. God had chosen Moses to lead the people into the promised land. Moses, recognizing what a difficult task that was, asks for help. And God assures Moses that he would answer the request. He then asks for God's presence to go with them. And God again grants that request too, because the Lord was pleased with him and wanted to reassure him. And so we then come to this third request where Moses says, may I see your glory. The Hebrew word for glory in the Old Testament is kavod. And it's a term with both social and moral implications. And it stems from the root word for weight. It can mean glory, honor, respect, distinction, and importance. We can also think of glory in terms of beauty, especially in an artistic or aesthetic way. And that use of it as beauty suggests something which radiates from the one who has it, burning from one's very being. We often talk, don't we, of an inner beauty which, which radiates out from somebody. And in terms of God, 
This beauty is his very nature. So glory in Hebrew is seen as standing in the presence of someone of the utmost importance, position, and brilliance, almost to a degree that it is terrifying. And Exodus is full of examples of how terrifying this glory is. Just to give you one example, in verse 24, in chapter 24 and verse 17, we read, Now the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on the top of the mountain in the sight of the people of Israel. It's like a devouring fire. This is something that could destroy because of its power. So when Moses asked to see God's glory, he was not asking that God would help him with a job interview. He wasn't asking that he might find a parking space when the car park is full. And we've all prayed those prayers on occasions. But he wasn't asking for that. He was asking for something so much more. He was saying, I want to see you in all of your magnificence and perfection. I want to see you in your absolute entirety. And God answers the prayer, but not fully. God says, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. But you cannot see my face, for no one can see my face and live. You see, if he had seen him face to face, if he'd seen him in his completeness, the weight of that would have been too much to bear. But to catch even a glimpse of the glory of God was enough for Moses. And it should be enough for us as well. So I want to just say three things about this particular verse about asking that we might uh, see or may have God's glory. The first thing I want to talk about is the conditions for seeing God's glory, the conditions. And the first condition is obedience. You know, it's important to understand that God is not going to show his glory to people whose lives are not in tune with him. Out of the whole nation of Israel, Moses was the one who had a chance of seeing God's glory because God was pleased with Moses. Because Moses was living faithfully, as faithfully as he could amongst these people. Moses wanted to be taught the ways of God. Moses wanted to live in obedience with him. I'm not quite sure how willing the people of Israel were always in their desire to follow God. In the early part of the chapter we read, go up to this land that flows with milk and honey, but I will not travel amongst you, for you are a stubborn and rebellious people. If I did, I would surely destroy you along the way. Here is God saying, I'm preparing everything for you. I'm getting it ready. It's a land, it's fertile, it's prosperous. It's a land where you can live, and you can live there with me. But I'm not going to live there with you because of your lack of obedience, because of your rebelliousness, because of your stubbornness. I'm going to withdraw my presence from you. They became ashamed and they took off all their jewellery and they, they, they repented as they should because lack of obedience robs people from knowing the God who has called them. And so for us, if we're serious about praying a prayer like the prayer Moses prayed, show us your glory, then as, a, as individuals and as a church, that will not happen unless we are living obediently to him. If we follow our thoughts rather than his thoughts, if we do things our way rather than his way, if we think our way is best rather than following the way of God, then we will fall, fall short of receiving that glory he wants to show to us. We need obedience. But we also need humility. And Moses showed great humility, particularly in praying for the forgiveness of the people of Israel. Because Moses was prepared to lay himself at the mercy of God for his people. 
There's God prepared to destroy them, but Moses, refusing to think that he's okay, refusing to think that he's better than them, and leaving them to the consequences of an angry God, intercedes on their behalf and says, don't destroy them. They're your people. Continue to go with us. Continue to lead us. Continue to find this place that we're, we're moving towards. Continue to give us that land of milk and honey. And he said to him, if you don't personally go with us, don't make us leave this place. How will anyone know that you look favorably on me, on me and on your people, if you don't go with us? Without you, I'm nothing. Without you, we can't survive, is what he's meaning. And humility is recognizing our nothingness in the presence of God and our total reliance on him. Remember the words of Paul in Philippians chapter 2 where he speaks of Jesus. Paul says he emptied himself and became nothing. Although being one with God, he didn't grasp that. He was prepared to let it go in order to do, do God's will. And Paul tells us that we should have the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus. Obedience and humility. They're the conditions seeing God's glory but then we have the content of God's glory having said that Moses could not see his entire glory God promised he would show him two things and the first was his goodness the Hebrew word used here means good in the widest sense it can be translated as absolutely the best but also again includes beauty gladness Welfare, people's welfare, and fairness in the sense of giving good things across the board, but also showing fairness in a moral sense. So the first part of this glory that he shows Moses is the fact that he is absolutely good, he's totally fair, he's morally true, and he's able to provide. It can sometimes be hard living for God in a world where so much is not as it should be. Only this week we've seen so many problems in our politics. We've seen evil in the world with people going into a city and, and, and randomly killing people. We've seen so many acts which are so morally wrong. And it's difficult sometimes living in that atmosphere. And when we see people supporting some of our political some of the political actions of some people trying to justify it we question that as well saying how can these people not see the truth of this how can people not realize how wrong it is but we're called to live as the people to show signs of god's goodness and thankfully we can see signs of that goodness in our world you may have heard some of the words that were spoken by the parents of those two teenagers who were killed, asking that people were to forgive, of whatever faith to forgive and to work for good, and to look after each other and care for each other. To me, that's a sign of God's goodness in the midst of so much pain and so much suffering. When in the midst of danger, we see somebody risking their life to save others, Again, it's a sign or a glimpse of God's goodness. When we see in the political realm that there is somebody who's prepared to say up and stand up and say, this is wrong, this shouldn't be happening, and despite the party lines that I've, I've followed, I'm not going to do this anymore because I believe in justice and truth. We see a glimpse of God's glory. When, despite the challenges and persecution in some parts of the world, the church stands firm in its devotion to Christ and is prepared to put up with suffering and hardship, again we see glimpses of God's goodness in the world. Part of the content of God's glory is that goodness, that absolute goodness and that morality that follows it. The second, of course, is his grace. And the Hebrew word used means grace, especially in the sense of compassion and kindness. 
God reminds Moses that this grace is a universal grace in the sense that God will choose whomever he wants to, to give it to. I will, I will give compassion to whomever I choose and I will give compassion whenever I choose is what God is saying. And I think about myself in this context. Who am I that God should have chosen me? What have I done to merit his love and his attention? I remember Frank Cook, a great preacher of uh, previous, previous years, when he was uh, president of the Baptist Union many years ago, saying in his presidential address, he said, I didn't find God. God rolled over a stone and found me. That's God. He chooses us because he chooses us. He loves us because he loves us. We haven't done anything to deserve that love. We haven't done anything to warrant it, but God has chosen us. And God's grace is given by him to whomever he chooses. And who are we to question that choice? So back to the passage, look at the Israelites. They had nothing going for them. They weren't special in the eyes of the world. They were totally undeserving, yet God chose them to be his nation. Small though they were. And in the same way, he chose me. And in the same way, he will continue to choose people. He's chosen those of us here who follow him. And he will continue to pour out his undeserved grace wherever he feels fit to do so. That's the content of God's glory. But then finally, there's the consequences of seeing God's glory. God passed by and showed Moses his glory. And Moses received fresh instructions for, his, for the people. And he spent 40 days and nights on the mountain. And this is what we read in verse 34, verses 29 to 35. When Moses came down the mountain carrying the stone tablets inscribed with the terms of the covenant, he wasn't aware that his face glowed because he had spoken to the Lord face to face. And when Aaron and the people of Israel saw the radiance of Moses' face, they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them and asked Aaron and the community leaders to come over and talk with him. Then all the people came and Moses gave them the instructions the Lord had given him on Mount Sinai. When Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil over his face. But whenever he went into the tent of meeting to speak with the Lord, he removed the veil until he came out again. Then he would give the people whatever instructions the Lord had given him, and the people would see his face aglow. And afterwards he would put the veil on again until he returned to speak with the Lord. You know, in making that request to see God's glory, I'm not sure that Moses would be aware of the consequences. He was totally unaware that being in the presence of God's glory caused his face to glow with a reflected glory from God. But other people noticed. They saw it. And glorifying God means reflecting his likeness and making the invisible God more visible to others. To glorify God means to maintain his reputation in our sinful, broken world. And in the New Testament, we have the story of the transfiguration. Another story where this time it's the glory of Jesus that shines through. You remember, he goes up onto the mountain to pray, takes three of his disciples with him, Peter, James and John. And there, as they're praying, his outward appearance changes. And there's this glorious light that flows from within and his clothes change and he's totally, totally different. And Moses and Elijah appear with him and they talk about his departure, his exodus. This is the new exodus. This is Jesus going to the cross. This is Jesus dying in our place and then following that, the glorious resurrection. And the disciples saw his glory. And what did they do? They wanted to stay there and try to preserve it. They wanted to contain it in shrines. But that is never the intention of God. And God reminded them, this is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. And it's a reminder that when we see the glory of God, 
it should always prompt us to do what Jesus tells us. It is not for containing or preserving, much as we would like to. That would make it like some uh, fantastic piece of jewellery in the Victor Victoria and Albert Museum. Something that we just go and look at and say, oh, that's nice, but doesn't really do anything for us. No, the glory of God is something that we need to take, well, not take, but to take hold of us and then prompt us into action. We're to show it in our lives. And so we must reflect God's goodness by standing up against the injustices and evil in the world, whether they be global or whether they be local. What are the issues in which we need to be involved in order to reflect God's glory? What should we be doing as a church or as individuals? What are the needs around us that need to be addressed? And how do we address them? You see, we cannot see God's glory and do nothing with it. And we're also to reflect his grace. Who are the people that the world rejects but God might choose? Who are those God is calling us to reach out to? Even if other people have already decided their fate or their future. God didn't write anybody off and neither should we. What we need to do is show them in our words and actions something of God's glory and allow him to do his work with whoever he chooses, whenever and wherever he chooses. Do you remember those words of St. Teresa of Avila? I've always loved the saints. There are some great words from some of the saints of old. But this is what she said back in the 16th century, but it still resonates for us today. She said, Christ has no body now on earth but yours. No hands but yours, no feet but yours. Yours are the eyes through which, which is to look out Christ's compassion for the world. Yours are the feet with which he is to go about doing good. Yours are the hands with which he is to bless men, and we would include women. Now, we are those who are to take the glory to other people. So are you prepared to be God struck? Ensure the conditions are right. Be obedient. Be humble. Look for the content of goodness and grace. And seek to understand what that means. And don't forget the consequences. We can't keep his glory to ourselves. It must be reflected in a needy world. Let's pray together. Father, we just...